and welcome to A Treasury of Massachusetts Historic Houses, Part 2. My name is Catherine Algor, and I'm the president here at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I love me a historic house. And what could be better than touring them from the safety and comfort of your own home with maybe a glass of wine? So really looking forward to the program tonight. But for the moment, let's do something fun. Let's go back in time and let's do a little real estate shopping. So Gavin, can you take us away? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and welcome everyone to uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society's online program. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Gavin Cleesbys and I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, this is the second installment in a three-part series we are hosting on local history institutions. The first program, which we held last week, uh, looked at house museums. Uh, tonight we'll explore museums made from authors' houses, and next week we'll look at hidden gems of local history. We will be guided in all three of these explorations by Bill Hosley. Uh, Mr. Hosley has worked in public history for many years and is passionate about the value of local institutions. He has been a curator at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, the executive director of both Connecticut Landmarks and the New Haven Museum, and for the past 16 years has run Terra Firma Northeast, a cultural resource marketing and development consulting firm. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bill Hosley, who will introduce the individual sites that we'll be visiting. So Bill, if you'd like to take it away. Great. And let's see if I can screen share. Um, hey, uh, uh, Gavin, Catherine, Sarah, thank you so much. This has been incredibly rewarding for me and I hope all of our guests and we're continuing with episode uh, two in the series and uh, let's go. Greetings and welcome to a treasury of Massachusetts House Museums and Historical Organizations, a uh, joint venture between me, Bill Hosley, and my Housing Our History Facebook site and Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, too rarely said, but house museums and historicals are by far the largest segment of the museum industry. There are thousands and thousands are amazing, some more than others. The sector struggles, many orgs are poor and almost everything in the current form of philanthropy and agency support is kind of aligned against them. Collectively, however, they are nothing short of a civic miracle. Then in 2002, encouraged by the National Trust's marketing department, uh, Trust CEO Richard Moe launched the Too Many House Museums movement. You can check out my YouTube channel for more details, but my sense from day one is that this campaign was rife with uh, you know, cluelessness really. There is rarely a hint that the champions of the Too Many movement get out much or have seen even 5% of what a place like Massachusetts has to show for itself. Collectively, they are nothing short of a civic miracle. Then in 2014, Ruth Graham at the Boston Globe became the first journalist in America to welcome a dissenting point of view to the table and make an advocacy argument. Here we are six years later with this three-part series of webinars on Massachusetts House Museums and Historical Organizations. And let's face it, there's no place better in the US to do this because not only does Massachusetts have the most per capita, but they are among the pioneers and originators of the genre. As a little background, the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, now historic New England, was at added as early as 1909 with the charismatic visionary founder, William Sumner Appleton. The idea spread and over time, historic New England has amassed a renowned network of astonishing house museums. This is an example that Josiah Quincy House is a time capsule from the 19th century, a palimpsest, layer upon layer of family history, perhaps the rarest and most precious thing of all, recently given a state-of-the-art restoration aimed at intensifying and clarifying the very qualities that make it special. None of this is new. Since 1909, Paul Revere's house has been a public treasure and long one of the star attractions of Boston's Freedom Trail. Uh, and what's not to love about President John Adams' Peace Field 
a National Park Service site, a house museum that is also a time capsule, not a restoration, almost unheard of among presidential sites. This week, we're looking at authors' houses and we'll hear from our friends at the Emily Dickinson House uh, Museum in Amherst, the John Greenleaf Whittier Birthplace in Haverhill, and Orchard House in Concord, home of Louisa May Alcott and the setting for her famous Little Women. Concord was famously home to several of our giants of American literature, and there are other sites and or collections associated with most of them, including Henry David Thoreau, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and this, the home of Ralph Waldo Emerson, scrupulously preserved by his daughter, shown in the upper uh, right there. The Trustees of Reservations, uh, now known as the Trustees, a Massachusetts-based 130-year-old conservation land trust that owns and operates a handful of house museums, preserves and pre presents the boyhood home and summer resident of William Cullen Bryant, one of the ninth of 19th century America's most influential literary lions. It's located in the Highlands Hill town of Cummington, just six miles from the Shaw Hudson House featured in our first episode last week. In Yarmouth is the Edward Gorey House, a perfect year round experience of the macabre, home of one of the 20th century's, 20th century's favorite authors. The famous and beloved Susan B. Anthony, whose birthplace museum is in Adams, Mass, is not primarily known as an author, but guess what? writing was an indispensable part of her identity and effectiveness. Massachusetts Historical Society has stepped out with programming, on-site exhibitions, and the kind of scholarship that brings house museums and their stories to life. So it's great to be doing this series with them. Uh, the Housing Our History Facebook community since 2011 has posted hundreds of reviews of house museums and historical society, including thousands of photographs. The Massachusetts History Alliance represents a rising tide of advocacy and reflection. Why it matters, Harvard professor Robert Putnam in his sequel to the famous Bowling Alone argues that our nation has had multiple pendulum swings between being me-centered and we-centered. We are at the end of a me-centered cycle that began in the 1960s. Getting from me to we is going to take infusions of civic attachment. What better way to begin than by embracing learn local in all its uh, aspects, bringing the power of local history into the classroom. So uh, let's hear it from our guests. We're going to start uh, with uh, Jay Cleary from the Whittier uh, Birthplace. And then second, we'll hear from Jan Turnquist at Orchard House, the home of Louisa May Alcott. And then finally end up with uh, Jane Wald from the outstanding Emily Dickinson House. So off we go. Thank you to Catherine, Gavin, Bill, and Sarah for inviting the John Greenleaf Whittier Birthplace to be part of this program today. I'm sitting in for our executive director Keely Paré, who was unable to attend due to a previous commitment. And I might add, Catherine, that John Greenleaf Whittier was a member of the MHS. We have a number of slides today along with a video to show you. The first slide is a uh, photograph of the Whittier birthplace in Haverhill. And that shows you the birthplace, which is located on a country road in Haverhill, Massachusetts. A little bit of Haverhill history. Haverhill was home to the Penacook and Abenaki peoples. It was originally referred to as Pentucket. The first English settlers landed in 1640, some 20 years after the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth. And this home was built by John Greenleaf Whittier's great-great-grandfather, Thomas Whittier, in the year 1688. And now we could go to a video with Gus Roosh, who was our curator for many years, now retired, to give you a little information. 
about the birthplace. Welcome to the birthplace of John Greenleaf Whittier, abolitionist, poet, politician, editor, reformer. This house was built by his great great grandfather Thomas Whittier in 1688. He built here because he saw water coming down the brook, down the hill here, and he, it would provide water power. And so the, he decided to have a nice big farm for the Whittier family, which had been expanding once he re reached Haverhill. Uh, they built in 1688 four rooms in this house. They built the dam up the hill. They built a sawmill, a grist mill, and then they started building this house. Only four rooms though at the beginning. Uh, a small kitchen, a sitting room, and two bedrooms above. But in the year 1700, 12 years later, they decided that the kitchen was much too small when all the Whittiers arrived here. So they started digging out a basement for a huge kitchen. And they ran into a boulder at one point, so they just built on top of the boulder a nice little room, which became the bedroom for the poets. The great, great grandparents, then the great grandparents, then the grandparents, and finally the poet's father and mother. It's a nice little room, it's cozy in the winter um, because that heat rises and the ceiling in the little bedroom is a little higher than the ceiling in the main kitchen. The main kitchen, the 1700 room, became the famous room. It's the room in which when John Greenleaf was 10 years old, 18, 18, they had the big snowstorm. Later on, that became the poem Snowbound when Mr. Whittier was in his 50s. But while he lived here, he was fifth generation, by the way, Why, while he lived here, I have to tell you that he didn't like farming very much, but he loved going to school, and that was in the winter time. The schoolhouse was right up the hill, the one-room schoolhouse. Joshua Coffin was the teacher. And every day in that schoolhouse, Greenleaf, he was called Greenleaf all the time here. His father was John. In the schoolhouse, the teacher would read a poem to the kids every day. He liked listening to the poems. And he had a great interest in it. He didn't want anyone to know he was writing poems, though. So he'd come home and do his chores and go back up the hill here, up the road, and there was a huge elm tree. Later on, it became the Whittier Elm because of him. He climbed the branches, he hid in the branches, and that's where he started writing his poems, in a tree. One night, though, in this house, he finished writing a final copy of a poem called The Exile's Departure. For some reason, he signed it with just this strange looking W, no Whittier, no Greenleaf, and he went upstairs to do something. And while he was gone, his oldest sister, Mary, I kind of kid when I call her Sneaky Mary, but that's in a good way. She went over, she picked up the poem, she read it, she thought it was wonderful. She hid it, didn't tell her brother. And the next week when the newspaper arrived here from Newburyport with the mail, she sneaked that poem out of here to the Newburyport Free Press. The following week, that poem was in the newspaper. Um, Uncle Moses realized that he saw that W, he knew wh who had written the poem, and he called Greenleaf over and said, is this yours? Well, Greenleaf was really puzzled. He had no idea how his poem got in a newspaper. So his sister, Sneaky Mary, she had done him a big favor. 
He got out of the one-room schoolhouse up the street, he's working on the farm. He's still writing more poems, and she's still sending them down to the New Report Free Press. After a while, that publisher down there realized, who is this W? He came to this house. I'd like to meet the poet. The poet wasn't here, the poet was across the street. He was chasing a hen underneath the barn. His sister went over to get him, and when this, he came across, came in the back door, went upstairs, changed his pants, but he didn't check his pants out very carefully. He came down into the main room, the big kitchen, to meet his guest, and then realized that he didn't have a pair of his pants on. He had a pair of his younger brother's pants on, and they were very, very short. Uh, he was embarrassed to meet this guest. Even when he was an old man, he was embarrassed about the whole situation because his guest wasn't just any guest. It was William Lloyd Garrison. And then Mr. Whittier, he got involved in the slavery issue with Mr. Garrison, and for 30 years, that's what they were involved in, trying to end slavery before it ever came to war. As we all know, the Civil War came along. So Mr. Whittier's life, well, he was a little bit of everything. He was even a representative from the Amesbury area in the State House in, in Boston. And he used to brag to people that he had voted for Abraham Lincoln four times. People were scratching their heads, but he had. See, he was a member of the Massachusetts Electoral College. So he voted for him twice as a citizen and twice as a member of the college. He got a kick out of pulling that trick on people. He had a great life, but it all started right here, right here. So that's our little video um, with Gus Roosh, who was a wonderful curator and regaled hundreds of visitors with stories about John Greenleaf Whittier. In this slide we're looking at right now, this is Whittier's birthplace, appropriately enough taken in the winter because of the poem Snowbound. And it gives you a sense of the, the isolation of the farmhouse in terms of where it's located in East Table. If we go to the next slide, who was John Greenleaf Whittier? Well, as Gus told you, he was a farmer, he was a poet, he was an ardent abolitionist, one of the leaders in the abolitionist movement in this country as well as a newspaper editor. Now the photograph on the left, or actually it's a portrait, that's a young John Greenleaf Whittier. On the right hand side is a photograph and this was taken at the Amesbury home located um, on Friend Street in Amesbury, the Whittier home it's referred to. That's Whittier as an older man sitting at his desk. That's the image most people think about when they think of John Greenleaf Whittier, the older man with the beard. If we go to the next slide, that's a view of the house from the road without snow. And we uh, had talked about the Penacook and Abenaki people uh, living in the area called then Pentucket, later named Haverhill, once the English settlers arrived in 1640. If we move to the next slide, on the left-hand side is the portrait, and it's a painting done by Deacon Robert Peckham. He's an artist from Bolton, Massachusetts, who was an abolitionist. Now, the interesting thing about this portrait is the original is on loan to the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC, as part of an exhibit. So that's Young Whittier. If you look at the bust on the right-hand side, that was done in 1874 as Whittier was older. And that was done by a gentleman by the name of Preston Powers. So there's the, the comparison between the young Whittier, the abolitionist, the older Whittier, who was known as one of the fireside, fireside poets. If we could look at the next slide, we have three photographs. Now the photograph on the left is Fernside Brook, which Gus had referred to in the video. 
And in the upper right hand corner, barely uh, visible, are three women wearing long dresses heading down towards the brook. That was taken as a stereoscopic photo, probably in the late 1800s. The top photograph on the right hand side is labeled visiting day at the Whittier birthplace. So back in the day, people in Boston would get on a train, train up to Haverhill. When they embarked from the train in Haverhill, they boarded trolley cars and trolley cars took them from downtown Haverhill out to the birthplace. And in this photograph, you can see people walking along the road over the bridge to the birthplace and they're lined up to get into the birthplace. In those days, this was referred to as a pilgrimage. And the photograph on the bottom is kind of a before picture. So this building was purchased, the home was purchased in 1891 by Whittier's childhood companion and classmate at what was called Haverhill Academy. They attended together in 1827. In 1891, a year before Whittier died, his friend and classmate purchased the building to make it a shrine and a memorial to his lifelong friend. And so this is the before shot and it was fixed up and it looks a little bit better than this today. If we go to the next two slides, we're gonna show you some of the interior shots of the birthplace. Now this is a smaller dining room and you can see there's a fireplace there. It's one of two fireplaces in the birthplace. Beautiful, beautiful wood paneling. And then of course, we'll go to the second slide. It's the same room from a different view. You can see the bust on the right hand side and portraits on the wall. And finally, we're going to go to a photograph of the hearth. And this is the hearth that Whittier referred to in the poem Snowbound. It was uh, the central meeting place of the family. I'll read two lines from the poem about the hearth. Shut in from all the world without, we sat the clean winged hearth about. And directly in front, you can see a log with five pieces of wood sticking up. What the family did in those days was they put apples on the log, moved it close to the flame so that they would have baked apples. And he wrote about that in the poem as well. He wrote, the mug of cider simmered slow, the apples sputtered in a row. So that's the hearth and that's a very famous uh, part of the building, probably the most famous portion of the building. Finally, the next slide is just letting people know how they can get involved if they'd like to be involved with Whittier on uh, Facebook and Instagram. There's a photograph on the right hand side of a number of people in period costumes. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, every other year, we had a program called Snowbound Weekend in which people came into the birthplace and saw a reenactment of Snowbound. So since we're close to the public, our executive director, uh, and I give her a lot of credit with this idea, in October of this year, we had a kite flying festival. So with 69 acres of land, we didn't have a problem um, physical distancing of people. So 50 people came, mostly families, and um, we had a wonderful kite flying day here. We also have a walking trail on the premises so people can do things outdoors. And I wanna thank you for inviting us so that I could share this information with you about the John Greenleaf Whittier birthplace. Very good. I'm going to start by sharing my screen if I can. <laughs> I did. All right. Well, I am delighted to be here. I thank you all. I, I have to say I am very moved by the concept that house museums are, I think you said a miracle or, or something like that, Bill, uh, you know, a civic miracle. Civic miracle. Uh, yeah, I love that. I, I hadn't ever heard anyone say that, but I absolutely concur. Uh, Orchard House was built in the mid 1600s. We don't actually have a year. Um, so it was a very old house when the Alcutts purchased it. And in the middle there, you see the way it looks today. And on the left is a painting that May Alcott, the youngest daughter in the family, the one who is Amy in Little Women, painted at one point before it got the rich brown color that Bronson Alcott wanted it to have. So here we are seeing it now full screen. And from the very same angle where you see a, a, an image was taken of the Alcott family 
in front of their home. So we're very pleased that nothing has changed. Uh, really, the, the configuration of the home, almost all of the possessions that you see in the home were actually owned by the Alcott family. Uh, Amos Bronson Alcott is the father of the family, transcendental philosopher, educator. He was passionate about educa education and he was also an ardent abolitionist, and he and John Lee Greenleaf Whittier uh, were part of the Garrison Riot back in, oh, I don't remember the exact year, but you probably, some of you know about this. They were all friends with um, William Lloyd Garrison. Mrs. Alcott here you see on the right um, was equally as ab fiery an abolitionist, and her brother, Samuel May, was probably William Lloyd Garrison's closest friend. So there were a lot of connections with these people, which I always find quite fascinating. Here on the left, you see a younger image of the oldest daughter in the family, that is Anna Alcott. And when she's a little bit older, you see her on the right. And she is Meg in Little Women. Some of you know this already, that Little Women is quite autobiographical. There were many changes, as you can tell already, I'm talking about name changes. Time was changed as well, and I'll, I'll refer to that in a moment. Uh, Anna married John Bridge Pratt, the gentleman you see here, and had two little boys, Freddie and Johnny. In Little Women, Meg marries John Brooke. And I love Louise's little trick that John Brooke, uh, the, the real John Pratt, had his family had lived at Brook Farm. So she has a little fun with that. And Fred and John in Little Women become Demi and Daisy twins, a boy and a girl. Here we see Louisa at a younger age and then on the right at an older age. And of course, she is best known for having written and set Little Women in Orchard House. Well, for little women, not necessarily that it was set in Orchard House, but we love to name that fact. And uh, she wrote many other works. She was also quite a passionate actress, and um, I would say one of the very early feminists as well. Here we see Elizabeth. This is the only image we have of Elizabeth people will say to us sometimes, oh, is she the one who died? Her name does not change in Little Women. She's Elizabeth or Beth. And uh, this is her little melodeon with that image above it in Orchard House. And yes, the, what you hear and read about Elizabeth in Little Women was true to life of our Elizabeth Alcott. Here we see May Alcott, the youngest daughter. She is Amy in Little Women. And I love this image on the right. This was done later in her life when she was studying art in Europe. And she went as a young woman, not accompanied by a gentleman. That was quite bold in those days. And her roommate, Rose Peckham, painted this image of May Alcott. And it was sent back home um, because her family, of course, missed her dreadfully. She was so far from home. I loved her mother's reaction. She thought the painting was wonderful. She was so pleased to see her daughter again. But she said, that hat is a little too much Paris. She thought a nice, simple snood would work better. Now, May ultimately does marry while she is abroad. She actually marries this Swiss gentleman, Ernest Nieriker, whom she met in London. They were married in London, but then they moved to France, just outside of Paris, a suburb called Midon. They had one daughter, and she's there on the right. Her name is Louisa May Nieriker. Very, very sadly, when that baby was just a few weeks old, May Olcott did not survive whatever had happened to her, whether it was childbed fever or cerebral meningitis. Those were two ideas put forth. Um, but she had asked her husband, being so young, he's 15 years younger than his bride, May, uh, she said, and she knew he was a businessman. He was just getting started. She was a little worried if something happened, as would happen to so many women in childbirth. Would he permit the baby to go to the United States to be raised by Louisa? Because May was 
so um, grateful to her sister, Louise, who had done so much to help me financially. And also, of course, they were very close. All of the sisters were very, very close with each other. And he did reluctantly agree, thinking nothing would happen. But sadly, that is what happened. And little Louisa May Nierker did travel to the United States when she was not even a year old and was raised by Louisa May Alcott until the time of Louisa's death. Now, May Alcott, this, this um, young woman who traveled to Europe and studied and, and had a lot of success on many levels, had two paintings accepted in the prestigious Paris Salon, where they would have perhaps 8,000 entries, most of them from established male artists. And here she was, an unestablished female foreign artist, um, and she was accepted with both of these paintings, The Still Life and La Negresse. And people have talked a lot, May herself talked about the fact that her family's abolitionist passions come through in that painting. It was a Parisian model who was known for being so light and happy. And May said, I don't know how I got that expression out of her. It must have been my parents' abolitionist uh, influence in my soul. Um, this is the kitchen of Orchard House, and it was uh, an additional building. The, the 1600s house that, that I showed you at the beginning was just two rooms below with two above, and then a tenant house was rolled down a little hillside and attached, and this is part of that tenant house. And you will see here in the kitchen, uh, the soapstone sink that Louisa May Alcott purchased for her mother. It was quite a luxury to have a sink like that. And the fireboard, well, it's actually the breadboard, but on the back side of it, Mrs. Alcott allowed her daughter, May, to experiment with something that they called pyrography, fire writing. And that is where you keep the poker in the hot coals long enough to then bring it out and burn into the wood. And that was an early artistic attempt by May Alcott on the back of her mother's breadboard. Now, the kitchen you see in the background there, you could come through that door and right into the dining room. And you'll see in the background at the fireplace, there's a fireboard cover there that May did. And this would be the scene of theatricals. Even into their adult years, they were putting on theatricals in that spot. The table is a gate leg table. It folds up. It would go right out of the way. And the staircase going up the back there, and you see again the little melodeon I showed you a moment ago with Beth's image, that staircase was where they could escape quickly to change a costume and come back down. And Fred and John, those two little boys of Anna's, would, especially John, actually would write later about the great fun they all had when his mother, Anna, and his aunt Louisa would put on these theatricals for family and friends, even as women, they were still doing this. They did it, of course, as young girls as well. Now, in this room, there is a portrait that I like to uh, mention to people is, well, it's by George Healy. I like to mention to people that I only know of one other dining room in the United States that has a George Healy painting in it, and that is in the White House. Uh, it is the great painting of Abraham Lincoln. George Healy was a very, very important artist. He was known for his realism. When he learned that the famous Miss Alcott was in Italy at the same time he was, he wanted to paint her. And she was a little shocked when she finally saw his work because she had been so ill. I'll talk about that in a moment. But I think she didn't look in the mirror enough and didn't realize quite what she really looked like now. Um, you can see the contrast with how she looked before she went to serve as a nurse for the Union Army in the Civil War. I mentioned that the family were abolitionists. They were part of the Underground Railroad. And Louisa May Alcott at age 30, just a few years after this daguerreotype was made on the left, uh, Louisa served. She got very, very sick with typhus, pneumonia, and the treatment, which was calomel, which is mercurous chloride. So ingesting a large, large quantity of mercury was tough on the system. And it, it changed her appearance greatly. When she saw this painting, she said, it should be hung behind a door. I look like a smoky relic from the Boston fire. 
uh, but of course it's on display in Orchard House today. I also like to point out that she was so famous immediately. This painting was done just a few years after Little Women was written, not even a decade after Little Women was written. She was so famous. Her book was being translated around the world already. And people have told me that they say she was in her day more famous than JK Rowling today. Now you see the dining room in the back Coming forward now, you're in the parlor. This is where the audience would sit. That round table in the middle is would often be moved out of the way. In fact, it's moved out of the way today. It goes to the far left of your screen, a little off screen where there is a fireplace. And in this room, not only did they have wonderful entertainments for their friends every single week, they were at home on Monday nights and people just came. They knew to come on a Monday night. They might play charades, they'd see a play, they'd sing, they'd dance, they'd have wonderful fun. But the most special event, well, oh, I forgot to mention the fireboard here. This is in the parlor there. And May would cover these fireboards for the summer so that you didn't have to look at the open fireplace. But the other thing I want to point out is that Anna and John Pratt were married in that room in the parlor. Now I can assure you John Pratt did not wear that costume <laughs> when they were married, but he probably wore that very costume when they met because Anna and John were in a play together and it was for the Concord Dramatic Union, which today is called the Concord Players. That had been established by Louisa, her sisters and friends, the Concord Dramatic Union. And this, the play that they were in when they met was called The Loan of a Lover. And at Orchard House, we like to say that loan became permanent because after they met, they fell in love and they became married. This is the upstairs bedchamber that Anna and Louisa shared at first, but very soon after they moved into Orchard House, Anna did marry just two years after they moved in. She married John Bridge Pratt, as I just mentioned. And so Louisa had this room to herself. And the desk that you see in the back between the two windows is a little shelf desk that Bronson Alcott built for his daughter. I point out that at that time, women were not supposed to do writing seriously. It was something that was considered, if it's serious, you know, books, things that you want published, that's the public sphere, and that's appropriate only for men. Women could write letters. You don't need a desk to write your letters. And it was, it was considered even dangerous to encourage women to take writing so seriously. The family didn't agree with that. Bronson built this desk to give his daughter agency and encouragement to write. Mother gave her a pen with a note, may this pen your muse inspire when wrapped in pure poetic fire. So they were extraordinary parents in that regard. And this is a painting in that room that May Alcott did and sent to her sister. She said that owl, which she picked up in a junk shop in Paris, reminded her of Louisa. Uh, John Ruskin, a great art critic in England, said that those pages of a book were amongst the best he'd ever seen. And uh, May said when she sent this painting home, that owl reminded her of Louisa. She was glad to put him in this painting and it was quite a, a success as you can see. This is now May Alcott's bedchamber and you see how very different this room feels even just looking at it. This was part of that tenant house that was added. So it's above the kitchen area a little bit. Part The tenant house was part of that dining room as well. So really this is more above the uh, dining back part of the dining room and into the kitchen area. And um, the little costume trunk back there is, if you look above it, there is a picture. And that picture was sketched by May Alcott of her sister Anna sitting on a dresser where they had made a little window cutting above it. And Anna was the fair Zara looking down over Rodrigo, the role played by Louisa. And in Little Women, all of this is described as if it is Joe March. That is, of course, Louisa's alter ego in Little Women. I don't think I mentioned that before, but Joe March is what Louisa calls herself. Meg March, of course, being Anna, the one looking out the window. And those boots you see in the trunk are the original that not only did Louisa wear them and write them into multiple plays, but she made them as well. On the wall of that room is Aurora bringing in the dawn, May sketched right on the walls all over this room. 
And here you see again, La Negresse, which is where we have it displayed. It is only a copy. All the other images that you see May's artwork are originals of May's, even the ones that were of J. Hey, but Jay, um, uh, James, <laughs> I can't even talk, Turner, the Turner copies, the J.M. Turner copies. Um, she was considered one of the best Turner copyists of her day. And these are May's original copies of hers. And La Negresse is still owned by a descendant in Europe. Um, this is the master bedroom. Mr. and Mrs. Alcott shared this room. It's right across the hall from Louise's room. And on the left is the judge, so well known uh, for the Salem witchcraft trials, um, Judge Samuel Sewell, the only one who repented and thought the whole thing was a travesty. He could have written about uh, the way it was written many years later about the Salem witchcraft trials. He knew very early on how wrong it was. And this is his great grandson, um, which is Mrs. Alcott's father, who was also a wonderful philanthropist. This is a little nursery built right off the back of that master bedroom. The little sofa was a salesman sample that had been acquired by Bronson Alcott for his grandsons. And the little doll on the right was made, handmade by Beth, and the face was painted by May. Now we come okay. downstairs, the last room. Down. I'm sorry. Someone... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Jen, but um, I, I do want to point out that we, we do probably want to wrap up relatively quickly because we still have to hear uh, from Jane from the uh, Emily Dickinson Museum. And so yeah. yes, so. I, I, I'm just at that point almost. So, Great, thank you. Uh, this is the study, Bronson Alcott's study. Uh, his motto, he was a lifelong learner. The hills are reared, the seas are scooped in vain. If learning's altar vanish from the plain, his good friends Emerson and Thoreau were often in that room. And then the very back of that area is a little um, art studio that he built for his daughter May. The Pirate of Timbuktu is one of her paintings in there. And the School of Philosophy on the grounds is noted by many people as being a place where um, the transcendentalists would meet. It was a, a school for transcendental philosophy and other things. It had actually started in that study and then was um, in the um, building that was, as you see inside a large lecture hall. This is actually from when the movie, the Little Women movie was shooting a scene in there. And then the house was abandoned. That little sign says, no trespassing in 1911. John Pratt, the son of Anna and others started the house. We've had to do extensive work on it to save it because it was sinking unevenly into the ground. And Laura Bush and Richard Moe, who was mentioned a few minutes ago, came to a special ceremony. I did portray Louisa May Alcott for that ceremony. And we have our website down there. So you will know how to find out more information about us. The letter that um, Laura Bush wrote, I, I won't read the entire thing, but I'll just say that she was so happy to come and celebrate with us because Little Women was one of her favorite books. And she writes, Dear Jan, or should I say Louisa, your account of Orchard House for this extraordinary woman. Thank you for your account of Orchard House and this extraordinary woman. Please thank your staff um, because she really feels as you do that these homes are absolutely priceless. Thank you. I need just a moment to get myself organized here and to share my screen. Um, Dickinson is having something of a moment, as you can see from these, uh, from these several shots of um, uh, recent renderings of the poet, um, A Quiet Passion with Cynthia Nixon, Wild Nights with Emily, uh, with comedian Molly Shannon, and the Apple TV series Dickinson with Haley Steinfeld. Um, this is, this is a, a, a period of time where Dickinson is emerging back into public view. She was really known for uh, a quiet life, reclusivity, a reticence to publish, and the habit of wearing white. Uh, but at this point, she's really charging back onto the field of popular culture to claim the kind of individuality unconventionality, assertiveness, and stark originality that have sometimes been 
uh, denied her in uh, popular mythology. When people search for Emily Dickinson, the real Emily Dickinson, they, they may start at the two historic houses in the center of Amherst, Massachusetts, which now comprise the Emily Dickinson Museum. This now famous poet was born at the homestead on December 10th, 1830. This house, as you can see rendered in 1856, this drawing, this house was built by her own grandfather in 1813 in the latest federal style. And it was said to have been the first brick house in Amherst. Dickinson's quiet life here was infused with a kind of uh, creative energy that produced uh, almost 1800 poems and some say as many as 10,000 uh, really vibrant letters, but her work remained virtually unpublished until her death in 1886. So although her increasing reclusiveness kept her close to home, her intellectual curiosity and her own emotional in intensity tied her deeply to the world around her. Among her most significant lifelong relationships were those with her brother Austin and her sister-in-law Susan, who lived just next door in a fashionable Italianate house built for them by Emily and Austin's father uh, that they named the Evergreens. It was occupied by the Dickinson family and its heirs uh, all the way until 1988, uh, but has remained virtually unchanged since the end of the 19th century and is something of a time capsule. Through Austin and Susan's intellectual and aesthetic interests and their involvement in community affairs, the couple made their home into a center of social and cultural life, hosting both local residents and prestigious visitors, um, including quite a number of the Concord writing set. Their three children, Ned on the left, Martha and Gilbert, were a significant presence in Emily's life. Uh, and the children thought of her as one of them. After Dickinson's death, her poems and life story were brought to the attention of the wider world through the competing efforts of family members and close associates. Her sister Lavinia and neighbor Mabel Loomis Todd saw to the initial publication of her poems. Uh, when I say that um, some of this posthumous publication uh, was brought forward by competing interests, it may uh, give you a sense of those competing interests to know that um, Mabel Loomis Todd was having an affair with Lavinia's brother, Austin, who was married to Emily's best friend, Susan, and that Mabel lived uh, just one street over from where, the, where all the Dickinsons lived. So it was a, um, an interesting little triangle. In the, though in the early 20th century, the poet's niece, Martha Dickinson Bianchi began editing new collections and, uh, uh, of, uh, of poems, of her aunt's poems, and um, a couple of family memoirs where she tried to tell the story of her aunt and her family from her own point of view. Uh, largely because of these efforts, uh, Emily Dickinson's unique poetic voice uh, uh, has uh, remained on the literary landscape and sort of captured the attention of audiences throughout the world. The Emily Dickinson Museum itself was created in 2003 when the Dickinson Homestead and the Evergreens merged under the ownership of Amherst College. Amherst College had owned the uh, homestead since, uh, to, uh, since 1965, uh, just as it had become a national liter literary landmark. Uh, it was at first used as a faculty residence and then later uh, was uh, turned over to purely museum functions. By means of a formal memorandum of understanding with Amherst College, the museum is governed by a semi-independent board of governors, uh, which is responsible for its own strategic plans and fundraising for operations, programs, and capital projects. The museum's mission statement to spark 
The Imagination by amplifying Emily Dickinson's revolutionary poetic voice from the place she called home captures the, po the poet's creative inspiration and her continuing relevance. So the Emily Dickinson Museum is open to the public from March through December. Uh, our primary interpretive program has been a one hour guided tour uh, of the historic houses and the property beginning at the homestead and then proceeding to the evergreens. Tours are offered between seven and 12 times throughout the day, depending on the season. Um, and they're led by uh, a single guide for groups of no more than, than 12, just because of the, the small spaces, the small room sizes. So I wanna say just a little bit about, um, about our docents and the, the training that they receive. They are, um, our guides are paid employees who undergo a, a kind of extensive training program prior to presenting tours to the public. And their training includes several focused content sessions on poetry, architecture, material culture, and, uh, and on guiding techniques. Guides shadow other tours uh, and are assigned readings, including Dickinson biography, letters, poems, uh, and critical studies of Dickinson's work and legacy. Uh, all of the guides write their own tours based on a tour outline uh, that suggests topics for each space uh, and the museum's current interpretive themes. Guides always include poetry and quotations from correspondence in their, uh, in their presentation so that our visitors get to experience Dickinson's own remarkable voice. Uh, a new interpretive plan uh, to be uh, completed in really just a couple of weeks reframes the museum's core message and supporting themes uh, with, this, uh, with this statement, Emily Dickinson forged her powers of creativity, insight, and bravery in her beloved home, creating revolutionary poetry that touches the world. Our interpretive themes are organized around these four Ps, person, place, poetry, and power. Uh, the last recognizing that Emily Dickinson courageously embraced her own unique personal vision for as an artist. Beyond the guided house tour, uh, the museum offers uh, other tours and short daily programs on specialized topics. One of the most popular is Grounds of Memory. It's a one hour uh, audio tour of the three acre landscape surrounding the two historic buildings. At each stop, uh, a two to three minute narration and a poem reading connect the landscape feature to Emily Dickinson's fascination with the natural world and uh, the history of her own family's occupation of the property. Uh, we maintain a varied schedule of about 40 public programs each year. And in the last 10 years, the programs have shifted emphasis from historical topics and biography, uh, slightly shifted uh, to, uh, to balance out more with um, uh, contemporary creative expression. Perhaps the most prominent of these programs is the Tell It Slant Poetry Festival, uh, which features uh, nationally recognized contemporary poets bringing their work to Dickinson's iconic homestead, uh, which has been a source of an inspiration for many of them. Um, along with these readings, uh, this is a, a once a year marathon reading of all 1,789 known Dickinson poems. Um, and in our virtual world this fall, uh, we registered almost 6,000 participants from 49 states and 60 countries. Uh, we don't know where Wyoming went this year, but we hope they'll be back next year. The audience <clears throat> for our in-person tours and programs has been about 15,000 Emily Dickinson fans from all over the world, uh, poetry and history enthusiasts, visitors to the five area uh, colleges uh, here in Amherst. Um, we boast uh, Amherst College, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, Smith, uh, and UMass Amherst. 
um, along with K through 12 and college educational groups uh, and bus tours. Uh, the Emily Dickinson Museum holds the largest and most varied collection of non-manuscript objects associated historically with the poet and her family. Uh, the, this material collection is complemented by uh, large and important major manuscript collections at Amherst College, Harvard, uh, Yale, Brown, and our local Jones Library. So this collection of about 8,000 objects um, represents a whole range of themes in uh, cultural and social history from the beginning of the 19th century when the Dickinson family first um, occupied uh, the house through the middle of the, of the 20th century. And they include things like women's history, domestic life, horticulture, fine arts and decorative arts, architecture and landscape architecture. At the time of the, the time that the homestead and the Evergreens were combined, um, the homestead owned only a few dozen artifacts, but the Evergreens, by contrast, was uh, chock full of uh, the, the, um, the household accoutrements of the Dickinson family themselves, some coming over from the homestead earlier and many originating at the Evergreens. Uh, they include um, fine art, silver, ceramics, furniture, toys, clothing, decorative textiles, household equipment, and more. The collection not only captures the details of 19th century life um, in what was then a, a semi-rural uh, educational and agricultural community, but it also illustrates vividly the daily life and writing habits of one of the world's greatest poets. Uh, we're currently engaged in a three-year project funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services to catalog our collection for the very first time since it uh, only emerged from the privately owned Evergreens, um, you know, not that, not that long ago. Uh, and we're very eager to complete that so we can allow more and greater use of these materials in, um, in the houses. A furnishings and exhibit plan guides the museum's use of collections to tell Emily Dickinson's story um, and will be more thoroughly used as we complete restoration of each new space. Uh, and really our restoration um, strategy for the last some years has been uh, on a space by space basis as our fundraising and um, uh, forensic evidence uh, have allowed. Uh, we did a lot of work in the first 15 years on infrastructure um, in things that you will never see like uh, drainage and um, fire detection and fire suppression systems and roofing and structural repairs. Um, to uh, get the houses in shape uh, to be secure uh, and so that we could preserve the, the contents. Next came uh, attention to the exterior restoration of the two houses of the landscape. And in this photo, for instance, you'll see um, a shaggy stand of hemlocks that were originally a well-kept hedge behind an attractive fence. Um, so, uh, this is the result of uh, one of those major uh, exterior restoration projects that we were able to transform that kind of um, neo-colonial version of the homestead to its 19th century personality when Emily Dickinson herself lived there. Um, we then uh, uh, moved inside uh, 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 first restoring Emily Dickinson's bedroom, which you see here as uh, before, and here as after, based on uh, findings uh, within forensic findings at, at the house. Um, after that, the family's library. Uh, here's a before, uh, and here is a fairly recent after. Uh, this project was completed just about three years ago. And then um, reconstruction of Emily Dickinson's conservatory from original materials that were saved on site 
um, on the left, you see the conservatory just before it was dismantled at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, you see the gap there uh, at, for the, um, uh, after uh, an exterior restoration of the homestead, and then um, the reinstatement of that uh, conservatory uh, about two years ago. So um, next, uh, there'll be a larger interior, re interior restoration of the homestead's main block, um, hopefully, uh, possibly in the spring and summer, um, as we understand uh, a little bit better whether we'll be um, open or closed during that time. Um, so uh, I have enjoyed this, this opportunity to uh, describe a little bit about the Emily Dickinson Museum and uh, appreciate uh, the, the tours that um, colleagues Jan Turnquist and Jay Cleary have taken us on as well. And I thank the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Historical Society uh, and Bill Hosley for the invitation to um, come talk about Authors' Houses, which is a, a, a real um, uh, genuine and almost um, outsized strength of Massachusetts historic houses. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, I, I do want to uh, thank everyone for uh, continuing to be with us. Um, I am conscious of the fact that we um, usually keep our programs to one hour. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if um, we might want to just suggest that people email us questions and we can pass them on. Um, that way we can uh, stay on track. Um, so um, I would like to very much thank everyone. I believe uh, Catherine Al Gore has returned also to thank people. Oh, yes, that was wonderful. And I'm going to speak for everybody in the audience. We can't wait till we can come visit you in person. Thank you so much. And this is an email address. Um, so if people have any questions um, or they would like um, to pass on a note or any kind of uh, comment to be passed on to the presenters tonight, uh, they can send it to programs at masshist.org and we will pass it along. So again, thanks to everyone for joining us. And thanks, Bill, if you'd like to say a final word. Uh, thank you, Jane, Jay, and um, Jan. I, I, just listening to you, I don't know if I can go another year with these houses being closed. I cannot wait to 221 when we're going to be on safari and visiting lots of these great houses. Thank you so, so much.